The highest compliment that the New York Times book review can give is to call a novel a great redemptive story. Now, the reviewer may be an atheist or an agnostic, or he may be a Buddhist, but whoever he or she is that's writing this review, they know that this is a great compliment to say this is a terrific, powerful, redemptive story. Well, guess what? All those redemptive stories in books that are not God's Word, those are merely a shadow of the truth of this book and this redemptive story, the prototype redemptive story by which all others should be judged and in comparison to which all others pale. It's an interesting thing about redemptive stories. What has to happen to make a redemptive story truly redemptive? Can everything go right in that story? No. That story depends upon things going wrong. And the greater the extent to which they go wrong, the greater the suffering, how bad and how dark it gets, the greater is the redemptive story when somehow it all turns around and ends up being glorious and triumphant. And so some people say, well, why did God make Satan I mean, make Lucifer, who sinned and became Satan. He knew all that, right? Why did he even make him in the first place? Well, why did J.R.R. Tolkien make Sauron? I mean, wouldn't the Lord of the Rings have been a better story if it wasn't for Sauron? Well, actually, no, there wouldn't have really been a story. Well, why did C.S. Lewis in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe the whole Chronicles of Narnia. Why did he create the white witch? I mean, wouldn't it have been a better story without a witch? Well, no. Actually, there wouldn't have been a story. You see, God has all of these attributes, and he had them, the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, from eternity past. But for him to be glorified in the eyes of his creatures, they must see his attributes. And for instance, how would we ever see the attribute of God's grace? We could see his power in, in, in the universe he's made, but how could we see his grace unless we were unworthy sinners in need of his grace, experiencing his redemption, and then praising him for all eternity. Ephesians 2, 7 says, in the ages to come, God will be revealing to us the riches of his grace and his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. What would we have known of all that? If Jesus had not come into the world to be our Savior and to deliver us from the worst possible scenario. I write novels as well as my nonfiction. And when I write a novel, I take characters in my book, you'd think sometimes I hate them or something. I mean, I put them through all kinds of miserable situations. My, my novel, Safely Home, that's set in China, the, the two main characters, Lee Chuan and then an American businessman, Ben Fielding, who were roommates together at Harvard. You know, they, if they became alive and I gave them the option of walking out of the story, for a large part of the story, they'd both want to leave it. Well, I don't give them that option. Why? Because in my limited way as a human author, I am sovereign over this book. I control what's happening in people's lives. Now, God does grant people freedom to choose, but our freedoms are limited because we are finite and by nature limited. So the question is, does God just let demons and people ruin the individual story of your life? 
Is it, is it like God has this plan for your life, but one day you're out, and all of a sudden, somebody's drunk, and they run a red light, and they smash their car into your car, and now that beautiful story that God had planned for you is ruined? No. And some of you know exactly what I'm talking about because you've been in that accident and have serious physical consequences, in some cases perhaps mental, emotional con consequences as a result of it. But God is at work to make all things, not some things, not a few things, not many things, not most things, and not, well, everything except, of course, obviously, big stuff like cancer and, and, and car accidents and abuse and, God forbid, rape and terrible things that have happened to me. But you know what? In the original Greek, all things means, guess what? All things, which is why the team of Greek scholars who translate in all of these different versions, all of them either translates it as all things or in everything. Same idea. No exceptions. Well, is that true or is it not true? Well, going back to the redemptive story, the redemptive work of Jesus is at the heart and soul of Scripture. He is the main character in the story. And if you ever wonder, does God really care? Does God really love me to let all of these things happen in my life? Or is he a distant God out in some corner of the universe that really doesn't care? Well, look at Jesus. Who in all human history took on, experienced more suffering than any other human being by far? And the answer is Jesus. Now, other people were crucified. Other people have been tortured as terribly as Jesus was tortured, but they were not taking on the sins of the whole world. Nothing compares to his suffering and so God came down to be one of us and to suffer with us. So the Bible is a true story with a powerful beginning and a triumphant ending and a middle part where stuff goes wrong. And guess which part of that story we live in? Not the beginning. That was Adam and Eve. They were the only human beings really in on the beginning. And it's not the end, but the promise of Scripture is that if you know Jesus Christ, you will be part of the glorious end without end that will go on forever. As Lewis says at the end of the last battle, the final book of the Chronicles of Narnia, the story that goes on forever in which every chapter is better than the one before. That's what is promised us in Christ.